Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the cathedral for our talk today during Holy Week. Uh, many of you remember our speaker from Tuesday, uh, but I'll introduce him again for those of you that have not met him. This is uh, the Reverend Ronald Calmer. Uh, Ron is the rector of uh, St. Clair's Episcopal Church in Pleasanton, California. Uh, Ron has been ordained a priest for 29 years uh, this summer, uh, and he's been the rector of St. Clair's for 18 years. He's a veteran of the U.S. Air Force um, and a graduate of uh, Church Divinity School of the Pacific uh, with his Master's of Divinity, and he's done doctoral work with Seabury out of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> Ron has had a, a, a passion for justice and for social action for as long as I've known him, for about 10 years now, and uh, has done some remarkable uh, work in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco East Bay Area, um, with his parish, uh, with also the local Industrial Areas Foundation, which is uh, the parent group of, for example, Metro Vancouver Alliance. Um, and um, he's uh, actually, I, I think I, I would say, cutting edge of, what's, uh, of what the church is doing now. Um, he's, a, he's a colleague and, and a good friend of mine, and uh, I've asked him to, to talk this week about uh, hungry, for the, hungry for Bread, Hungry for the Word, Hungry for Justice. And today's uh, topic will be Moral Action in the Real World and it's situated around food justice. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I want to uh, welcome Ron to come up and please give him a hand. Hello friends, and uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to be able to come and talk with you. You might find the uh, title a little uh, strange. The, what do you mean by the welcoming table? What do you mean by moral action in the real world? So let me unpack that. And part of the conversation I'm going to have with you is uh, some of the work that's going on in St. Clair's. And eventually, God willing, some of this work is going to be a dialogue between this cathedral and St. Clair's and others, whoever would be welcomed into the conversation of what this could look like. So the welcoming table uh, comes from a spiritual, African-American spiritual, which has been uh, it's been retuned, but it, it, it comes out of the South, um, and you may have heard it before, it's, uh, and there are different versions of it. It sort of goes like, I'm going to feast at the welcoming table some of these days. I'm going to feast at the welcoming table some of these days, my Lord. I'm going to feast at the welcoming table some of these days. I'm going to feast at the welcoming table some of these days. What in the world is the welcoming table? Let me go back here for a second. The welcoming table is God's table. And when I say it's based in the reign of God, and it's not just in the sweet by and by, it is based in the here and now. As I told you before, it's an African-American spiritual. It is rooted in the reign of God. Everyone's welcome to the table. Uh, that's just how God is. Uh, and the theology says there is no them, just us. So that the work, uh, you know, uh, yesterday I talked about this shift from the dialectical to the systemic. We need to change our thinking when we talk about the reign of God and the welcoming table. You know, we say, oh, we're doing ministry to them. That's the dialectical. But the welcoming table says there is no them. It's just us. Why? Because it's God's table. And God's table is full of abundance. God's table welcomes all. God's table, you even sit down with my, your enemies, right? Think about Psalm 23. Thou hast prepared for a table before me in the presence of my who? My enemies. That's the welcoming table. Is that easy to do? No. It could easily end up in a food fight, right? <laughs> in this world. Um, it also says that Jesus is the radical center. That you and I might disagree about such and such, right? But there are 
issues where you and I agree. And the places where we agree allows us to be together. And we say that underneath all that is Jesus moving us to be able to work together. Faith-based community organizing does just that. It, it, it'll work with anyone who's willing to be able to, to help further whatever the issue is that you're, you're doing. Um, and it is a mission, it is the mission of the, of, of the church rooted in the Lord's Prayer. You might say, well, what do you mean by that? When Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer and he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It presumes that God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. And any time we can embody the welcoming table, then we are living into the Lord's prayer on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, earlier, I talked about change being a wave. And faith-based community organizing I talked about in, in, in the wave that there are people who are in the trough who never want to change because it is comfortable not changing. We don't want to change. We don't want to be disturbed. And the tool for moving people to surf the wave of change is called agitation. Now, how many of you know what an agitator is? What's an agitator? Someone, what's an agitator? And at, how many of you have washing machines? I assume you do. What's that thing in the center? The thing in the center is the agitator. And it, what does it do? It stirs it up. It stirs it up and it gets the dirt out. <laughs> so we agitate one another to get the dirt out because we're comfortable. Please do not disturb me. I like life as it is. But the welcoming table is, you know, I mean, the reign of God is infinitely beyond us in one real sense. But in another sense, we as Christians are not called to be content with the world as it is. Why? Because this is God's world. Right now, in, in this world, um, people are becoming more hostile, more violent. The dean and I were on our way here and we were at a stoplight, and we saw this young guy get out of his car and was badgering an older guy who got out of his car, and they came to fisticuffs, and then they eventually got back in their cars and left. That's not the world I want to live in. I was wondering, is a gun going to appear? You know, is this how we solve things? It's not the world I want to live in, and I know that that's not God's world. The world I want to live in is the welcoming table. And so, again, my neighbor's concern is my concern because there is no them, just us. It's a part of us. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about Claire's Fair Community Garden. Uh, as uh, Dean Chris talked about, I'm the rector of St. Clair's Episcopal Church in Pleasanton, California. And... We had, when I came, we had this master plan that we were going to accomplish in 25 years. Uh, and the first phase of that plan was to expand the sanctuary because we were going to have more people. We pushed the walls back 19 feet. We got new, uh, we spent a lot of money. And we thought, we raised a million dollars and we thought for that money we were going to be also be able to get a parish hall and whatnot. And then came the surprise, you know, our neighbors didn't like the idea because we're in a suburban parish and they weren't happy about us expanding and they tripped us up and the price of steel and concrete went up and that million dollars became two million dollars and we still didn't have a parish hall. So the master plan just kind of tanked and part of the master plan included this piece of property that we have, this weedy patch of soil that was too small to do much with. And we were going to put our admin building out there and a labyrinth. Um, God had other plans. 
And so one day, uh, a member of the congregation came to me and said, you know, I belong to the Livermore Pleasanton Gardening Club, and we'd like to turn that piece of property that is turned into a dog park into a community garden. And I said, knock yourselves out. Go for it. Let's do it. Um, and so this video I'm going to show you, which is very brief, is about the transformation of this garden. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the garden.
So that's the community garden. In our first year, and that happened in 2020, we raised more than 2,500 pounds of fresh vegetables. We did this in collaboration with um, people who, are, who do this for the joy of gardening, but our own parishioners are involved. Our neighbors saw it and were excited and have been involved in it as well and are proud of it. As you saw, I pointed out at one point, our mayor is, uh, came out uh, to see it. Our bishop came out to bless it uh, because his whole thing is the environment. That's, that's his great drive. Uh, but we also collaborate with two organizations. One is called La Familia, uh, which brings fresh produce primarily to uh, Latino families, but not exclusively. And Culinary Angels, which is one of the slides in there, they take that food and they make delicious, nutritious food for cancer patients all throughout that region. So uh, the impact is huge, all because one person said, let's put a garden there. So that's, uh, that's our garden. Um, yes, please. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we had master gardeners come out and treat the earth. I, what they did, I can't tell you, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. But that's worthy of a dialogue between St. Clair's and here about how do you go ahead and take care of something like that? Because you're absolutely right. Um, uh, all that stuff was there. How are we going to make the land so that it grows usable food? So your question is spot on. I, unfortunately, am not the person to ask that. I'm just showing you the results. Uh, but we had master gardeners help us uh, make sure that that happened. Uh, I want to talk to you not just about um, Claire's Fair Community Garden, but I want to talk to you about Laundry Love. Laundry Love is a ministry of St. Claire's. It's intended to scale upward. Uh, what we do is we wash the clothes and bedding of low to no income families. Some of them are homeless, some of them are on the edge. Uh, some of them, it's just really hard. Uh, we brighten the lives of thousands of people through dignity, detergent, and uh, love. It's a nationwide movement, at least in the United States. I hope it's up here. Um, and it's, but it's also, again, collaboration partnership between St. Clair's Episcopal Church, St. Bart's Episcopal Church, Episcopal Impact Fund, SF Faiths, who are our funders. Um, we, I managed to get us uh, $16,000 in grants uh, to begin this ministry. Um, and basically, we, we go and we do laundry. Now, there are some who looked at that in, in my diocese uh, someone who will remain nameless, but I noticed that it made a national uh, newspaper uh, within the Episcopal Church that said, if all your church does is wash the clothes of poor people, then all you are is a laundromat. Talk about a total miss. Talk about a total miss. I'm telling this story because I'm not happy about it um, and because... Uh, if, how can you say you love God who you do not see when you do not love your neighbor who you do see? The two are interrelated. You know this. Jesus said, what are the two great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. And the second is like unto it, and love your neighbor as yourself. But this hunger for dignity also ties into food. The people whose laundry we do, <laughs> many of them have to choose between doing laundry and eating, doing laundry and cutting their medicine in half, doing laundry and putting gas in their tank. I don't know, I mean, I don't know what gas prices are like here. I imagine they're high. And in California in particular, Gas prices have gone through the roof. 
Uh, we're paying much, much more for them. So laundry love matters in feeding folks. So this is sort of what it looks like from where we are. We do free laundry. Uh, that's Advantage Laundry, Matt, that you see. The symbol at the very end with the heart with the laundry, that's the national symbol for laundry love. And uh, we don't have a lot of volunteers just because <laughs> there are a lot of folks that don't want to go this far. They're happy to write a check, but they don't want to engage. So we have to agitate our folk. We also invite other congregations. We, you know, this is uh, an Episcopal thing. This is a neighbor thing. Back to that, just us, not them. Um, so we're working on expanding that. But our intention is that we scale this up. We intend to have worship as a part of this. We want immunizations, haircuts, all kinds of things. Um, because the reign of God is also about setting people free. You know you're in the reign of God because you see uh, the fruits of what comes from it. You know, people not only have clean clothes, uh, people are able to make decisions that affect their lives, um, people are able to get the things that they need. Uh, those are signs of the reign of God. But here's another one. Uh, hunger for connection. St. Clair's, the, this doesn't tell you all the story, but St. Clair's spent a lot of money, approximately almost $50,000 in putting together our tech. We have essentially, I like to say we have a laboratory to be able to do all sorts of creative things because it's more than just a television studio. Um, you know, we broadcast on multiple platforms at the same time. But we, this was designed for a hybrid experience, sort of like what we're doing right now. But even more than that, it was designed for collaboration. Uh, and the fact that um, it, this came out of pandemic. And so this is going to allow us to uh, think more creatively. I, I, in the last talk, I talked about primary and secondary imagination. Um, and so part of the imagination was what if we could uh, live beyond the boundaries in which we have right now? We have people who uh, join us online, not just from Pleasanton, but throughout the United States and England and India. Uh, and so uh, one of the places I think that we find ourselves in this age is that people hunger to connect we have people who attended St. Clair's and have moved away, and they're never moving back. They've retired. They're living wherever they want to live. But they still hunger for connection. So they join us online. They make their pledge online. And so part of our work is to also incorporate those folks. What does it mean to be church in a broader scale? What does it mean to incorporate these folks into the leadership of the church, even though they don't live anywhere nearby? What would it mean to be in relationship with uh, the church or churches, uh, not just across town or in our diocese, but on different parts of the world? How could we do God's work together in more creative and unique ways? And so this helps open the door for just that. Uh, Dean Pappas and I are in conversations about what that might look like even here. The other thing is that some of the programs that are coming out of that tech are unique. So I'm going to show you a little video. We, for Lent, we, uh, well, first of all, St. Clair's has a church, a priest, I mean not a church, but a preschool. And uh, the preschool is called St. Clair's uh, Christian Preschool. And we have uh, the chaplain of that is right from here. <laughs> In fact, if someone could help me, help steer me as to where to get ketchup chips, I, I would be a hero in bringing those back unsmashed. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. I said, what are ketchup chips? She said, well, you know how you have jalapeno chips in this region? I said, here, it's about ketchup chips. I said, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Anyways, Miss Tracy does chapel time with the children. And we decided that for Lent, we would put together a series of six videos 
that included music and art and um, uh, story time. It, they're about uh, 15 minutes long, and it's called Miss Tracy's Chapel Time. What would it mean to share programming, not just through the cathedral, but, you know, uh, wherever in doing something like this? Anyways, this is the opening of Miss Tracy's Chapel Time, so you get a sense of what it's like. Oh, well, that's not what I wanted to have happen. Let's try this again. That's, uh, that's the opening of Miss Tracy's Chapel. Then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have so many, you know, pandemic wasn't just devastating, it also brought gifts. And what are the gifts that are coming out of pandemic that are forcing us to, you know, saying the old ways of doing some things are gone and they're never coming back? How do we inhabit new ways that will bring life and health not just to the church, but to the world, that Jesus came and gave his life, uh, and God, who loves this world and calls you and I to love this world. That's some of the things that I want to be able to point out to you in talking about the welcoming table. And I talked about doing this in the real world. We, we still have to think even broader because uh, oh, one, of the, one of the drivers for change is technology. And the virtual world is just going to be part and parcel of what we do, friends. So uh, unless you have questions, I'm at the end of my talk. And thank you for this time to be able to be with you. Before I go walking away. <laughs> yes, sir. size of the parish? Oh, we're small. Pandemic did, us, did, us, uh, did a number on us. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, we're hybrid church, so um, at our later service, uh, people come in, maybe 30 people show up for worship in person at the 10 o'clock service. We also have an earlier service, and so maybe we have 50 people showing up. If, if Average Sunday attendance is the, the, the guide, then, you know, we're in, we're, we, we, we could be in trouble. Although, I've got to tell you, our giving is through the roof. It's the highest it's been in my entire tenure. Um, but there are people online watching. And if you just count Facebook, you think, eh. But people watch during the week. And we don't know how many people are actually in the room watching. So I have one person who says, I watch every week. My wife is there. One of uh, the regular, another old timer is there. And they sit down and they have coffee cake and they drink coffee and they watch church. That's three people. Uh, but there are others like that. So there's no real way to be able to get the numbers all of it's a long way of saying that average Sunday attendance and how many people are actually participating in church is a big question mark at this point in the journey. So I, I, the, the church has about 250 people on its rolls, but I can't tell you that that's who comes to worship. Other questions? But it connects to, it connects to the volunteer issue. Yes. Yes. But for these programs that yes. are so expensive and wonderful, you have few hands on the, at the table. I have few hands at the table, that's right. 
So part of our work right now, we're calling Easter Resurrection Sunday. And we're doing things to remind people of all the good things that St. Clair does and is a part of. And trying to get more and more people. Not everybody feels comfortable coming back. I don't know if you've seen that here, but a lot of our folks aren't quite comfortable coming back yet. And that's part of our challenge. And so the, the work is, you know, I, I have a great staff which has been cultivated over time. Uh, and it's them mostly who's doing it and myself. Yeah, yeah. And, and the neighborhood. Yes, the well, that's right. Some of the things. Participate in the garden. And yes. Well, and I think that's part of the truth for um, faith-based, faith communities everywhere, that you've got to have these relationships, um, relationships with business, relationships with other nonprofits, relationships with uh, just folks who are looking to, to help. That's how we're able to do some of that. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. It's we do. We do. That the Livermore Pleasanton Gardening Club is really made up of only four people. But there are members of the congregation who participate, and as I told you, neighbors come and participate. And I think that's a good thing uh, because now we've got a relationship with the neighborhood that we didn't have before. You know, like I said, they saw our property and said, huh, dog park. Now it's a source of pride for them. So, yeah. So ministry in a different sense, really. Well, that's right. It's a, a different way of being, uh, but the signs of the Spirit are there. So, sorry, way in the back there. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Tracy, I'm having a difficult time hearing you. I'm... Yeah? Uh-huh. So you're wondering about Bible programs or children's literature? Oh, yeah. You know, what I find that people hunger for are blankets and socks. And, well, they want the worship, but they want, you know, uh, some of them are there with families, so they have chill, little children running around. They want coloring books. They want snacks. Uh, they want to be able to connect around those things. If you've got gift cards, now you're right being able to have those other things. Um, which is why we want to do the worship service uh, in the midst of it, because we do this because of our love of Jesus. But, but the, uh, we have to sometimes preach with the other gospel, um, which is to feed people's needs. But thank you for bringing that up. Anyone else? Again, oh, yes, please. Yes. So, you know, when we started off, maybe we were spending $50 a month, and then word got around, right? And so uh, some people are homeless. Some live in their cars. Uh, some are business owners right there in that strip mall that I um, tried to show you. Or when you so this is a strip mall, and um, <laughs> the businesses that are there are not wealthy. There's the Donut Wheel, <laughs> which is open 24 hours a day. There is uh, a, a person who does haircuts, another person who does nails. And as you can see, this is not, this is not fancy. This is not a fancy building. Uh, it's been around a long time. It's been rode hard and put away wet. <laughs> but these folks, some, sometimes they come looking for help, but they're also generous to the people who are in need there too. Um, the woman who does haircuts has told me that many times that she cuts the hair of uh, those who come, and I've said to her, well, maybe we need to be in collaboration about doing just that. Uh, the woman who does nails, she brings her laundry too. 
Uh, I've seen people in suits come. We don't turn anybody away, you know. Uh, so what happens is, is that we have, in addition to the money that we have, uh, we, and we keep good tra books on this, so we, we want to know what laundry uh, uh, unit you're using, and we want to know, or what dryer. We've got laundry sheets that are, uh, that are friendly. They look like dryer sheets, but they're actually biodegradable soap. And you just throw the sheet in there, and it dissolves, and it does your laundry and gets it clean. Um, and that was offered through Laundry Love. They're in partnership with someone else who does this. And they gave us uh, boxes of this to be able to use. Um, and it also helps from doing damage to the machines. If you put too much soap in, you know, some folks have no common sense on how much soap to put in, and they think more is better. And more is not better. You damage your clothes, and you can damage the machine. But with one of those sheets, it's easy. Uh, and then, uh, but we also will, if they want, we'll go up and we'll put the coins in. Uh, we get to engage them. We engage their children. Like I said, we had those items for the children. Uh, this is a national movement, and I hope it's up here. And if it's not, I would strongly suggest you reach out uh, to Laundry Love and find out more about who they are, But because they're they're trying to awaken all kinds of folks uh, to, to do just this. Faith, love, and detergent. <laughs> all right, thank you again. Appreciate the time. And uh, one of the things that this new digital reality offers us now is we can continue this relationship and we can actually engage with St. Clair's if we decide to. Uh, and to, to, whether it's a dialogue, to learn from each other, to support each other, and uh, that's one of the things we're gonna keep talking about is how now, using the tools that we've been given during the pandemic, can we make connections in, with geog in geographic areas that are beyond the solar mainland. Um, and the last thing now is since we said hungry for food, yeah. um, <clears throat> you are all welcome to uh, take a Mondi to go meal. Um, Vienna has prepared extra for all of us. If you want to wander around outside and you can get into line, uh, there's a meal waiting for us. And thank you for, uh, for being here today. And uh, come tonight, um, well, we have the, um, the, uh, the uh, lamentation for, the, uh, for those who've died due to overdoses coming up at 1 here. But this evening, we have our Monday Thursday service at 7.30. And uh, Ron will be our preacher tonight, Bishop John, our celebrant. So thank you again, everyone.